Good evening, Lakewood, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight for the first council session of 2018. I'd like to invite us all to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. And now let us uh, recognize our uh, tradition of observing a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Present. Here. Here. Litton. Here. O'Leary. Here. O'Malley. Here. Raider. Here. Reading and disposal of the minutes of the regular meeting of council held December 18th, 2017. Uh, move to um, approve those minutes without the necessity of a reading. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you like to call the first? Item one, elections for president and vice president of council. Uh, thank you. Uh, as the um, president pro tem, meaning the longest in the tooth on the council, it's my uh, uh, honor and obligation to uh, convene uh, at the beginning of the first council session, uh, council meeting at the beginning of the year. Uh, our first order of business is to consider election of council leadership, our president and vice president. as called under the uh, charter. Um, so I will now call for nominations for president of council. Councilman Linton. Uh, move to recommend uh, the nomination of Sam O'Leary as council president. Okay, we have a nomination of Sam O'Leary. Uh, Mr. Councilman O'Leary, would you, do you accept the nomination? I do. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, are there any other nominations for council president? Are there any other nominations of council for council president? Are there any other nominations for council president? Hearing none, I move to close nominations for council president. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? I oppose. I oppose. Okay. I, yeah, and I'd like to just, um, I oppose just because um, I feel that I was elected as part of a, a, of a change. And so uh, to continue with um, the same leadership as, as years past, I think that would be a disservice to why I was um, elected. So with that, um, um, I'd like to mark as opposed. Okay. So uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Th to be clear, the current motion is just on closing the uh, nomination. We're following uh, council procedures which are in close resemblance of Robert's Rules of Order. So in a second, we'll actually consider the vote to elect um, the nominee as president. But thank you for your comments. Are there any other, uh, uh, the chair will recognize any other council members who'd like to make a comment at this time? Okay. Um, then let's go to the motion. So we have one nominee for council president, and that is uh, to uh, elect Councilman Sam O'Leary as president. Um, so um, I will now call that motion since there, there are no other nominees. Um, but procedurally, let me call for, I, I'll, I'll move that we consider that nominee now for election. Do I have a second? Second. A uh, motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on that motion? I would like to make comment. Uh, okay, Councilman Rader. Thank you, uh, Mr. President Pro Temp. Uh, I think a lot of people did vote in this last past election, and to echo the uh, concerns, I think, of, of, of Ms. George. Uh, for this weekend, I, I had thought that we'd made some progress on some, some substantive issues. I think one of those issues a lot of you are here to hear about, uh, and I just, don't, I just don't know how uh, to proceed. I don't know if I just don't know who I can trust. I don't know if I can trust the current leadership, and I, I just wish that this all hadn't transpired on this first 
day, uh, and I, I feel really left in the lurch, and I feel like I, I cannot support uh, the leadership of, of past uh, moving into the future, so I, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to vote no. Thank you for the comment. Any other comments from other council members? Uh, we're simply uh, entertaining discussion on the motion to move forward with the vote on whether to elect Councilman Sam O'Leary as president. Any other discussion? Hearing none, uh, Mr. O'Malley, or no? Okay. Hearing none, I'll, I'll call the motion. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, so the motion is carried and Councilman Sam O'Leary is elected as president of council. Um, uh, I would like to continue with no objection as the presiding officer to proceed with the nominations and uh, motions for council vice president. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, so the, I will now entertain nominations for vice president of council. Um, are, are there any nominations for Vice President of Council? Councilman Linton. Uh, I'd like to nominate David Anderson, our Vice President. Okay, there's a motion or, or a nomination made. Uh, does Councilman Anderson, are you interested in accepting the nomination? Oh, yeah. Okay, Councilman Anderson is accepted. Are there any other nominations for uh, Vice President of Council? Any other nominations for Vice President of Council? Any other nominations for Vice President of Council? I repeat myself because it's a Robert's Rules tradition, not because we're, we have uh, faulty microphones. Um, hearing none, um, I will move to close nominations for Vice President of Council. Do I have a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to close nominations for Vice President? Hearing none, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the ayes have it. So we will now proceed to the motion to elect Councilman David Anderson as Vice President of Council. Uh, do I have a motion to so consider that motion? Second. I'll second. The chair will second. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on that motion? <laughs> Hearing none, all in favor of electing Councilman David Anderson as Vice President of Council indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the ayes have it. Uh, with that, um, we now have disposed of the election of council leadership for the new year, and uh, I will hand over the uh, presiding officer duties to the new uh, re-elected uh, council president. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Bullock. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, as was stated by Councilman Bullock, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, and to our new council colleagues, welcome. Without further ado, uh, let's get right into our agenda. Uh, we've taken care of the first uh, item. Madam Clerk. Item two, certificates of election. Move to receive and file the certificates of election. Second. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to receive and file? <sighs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. Item three, resolution 896317, a resolution authorizing the Rockport Square revitalization project tax financing agreement dated on or about May 10, 2004 with the Lakewood City School District. Thank you. Uh, I don't know that we have a formal communication accompanying this uh, resolution tonight, but uh, I know that Law Director Butler uh, has some background for us, and council members should also note that this was uh, the handout distributed to you um, at the start of the meeting, um, marked resolution 896317. Thanks, Law Director Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, resolution 8963-17 was sent to Committee of the Whole back in November, and it wasn't uh, uh, for lack of work that the resolution wasn't considered in Committee of the Whole by the end of the year. Of course, um, the resolution was considered in Committee of the Whole or was considered on the uh, floor when it was first introduced. Um, it's, an, uh, it's a resolution that would approve of an agreement between the city and the uh, school district that would amend a 2004 agreement that we entered into contemporaneously with the development agreement for the Rockport Square project. The Rockport Square project, as you know, uh, which is located on the eastern end of Detroit, uh, faced some significant difficulty after its launch. 
um, specifically when the housing market fell uh, out in uh, approximately 2008. Um, the developer uh, was unable to proceed with the construction of the project and um, uh, really it stalled. Its uh, resurrection over the past couple of years um, has prompted us to re-engage with the school district um, over this particular agreement that was originally attached to the resolution. Um, the school district pointed out to us that they believed that we had been, the city had been miscalculating its annual payments to be made to the school district, to essentially considered make whole payments. Um, because um, this project involved a TIF district, um, the normal process of receiving and distributing uh, property taxes to the city and schools after that TIF district was created in 2004 um, was modified for this particular district. And instead of those regular tax payments being split between the city and the schools, um, they would go into a fund that was meant to um, uh, provide assistance for the public improvement aspects of the project. Um, because the school district had to approve that TIF agreement back in 2004, that development agreement, and had to give up r regular income in order to do so, the city and school district entered into an agreement whereby the city would make, uh, attempt to make the school district whole uh, based on revenues that would eventually come in from the county. Um, you can see as, an, uh, as the first chart in the agreement that is attached to the resolution on the docket tonight, um, what those payments were supposed to look like um, over the years according to the school district. The city had been paying based on 2004 era uh, millage rates in effect at the time and the school district uh, has claimed, uh, and I would say not inappropriately has claimed, that as the voters of Lakewood have approved additional millage since that time, the city's payments, make whole payments to the schools, should have also been increased. They were not. Um, and so there, it leaves a difference. And the difference is, um, as you can see in the chart, $510,000 over that period of time from 2000 to 2017. Um, this agreement, this amendment to the original 2004 agreement, the make whole agreement between the city and the schools, would permit us to um, make these additional payments, permit the city to make these additional payments to the school district to make up for those lost years, um, but would also revise what we call the waterfall of how, we're, how we are to apply the money that comes in from the county while the TIF district remains intact. And that is um, uh, expected to be intact. Maybe Director Pay can help me out, but it's expected to be intact for how long? Uh, 2026. The TIF 2026, okay. Um, so the waterfall of payments has been revised um, in order to um, make sure that the city is able to pay all debt service for the bonds that were issued in anticipation of the Rockport project, um, and then pay the schools, and then split any overage after that. That's what this First Amendment does. Since it was in introduced on November 20, it was very slightly modified uh, by agreement of the administration and the administration of the school district. Um, and those modifications I am very happy to walk through, but they are, they are ministerial in nature. One is to permit the city and the school district to, um, to permit the city to make the payment rather than by the end of 2017, of course we're past that date, by the end of January 2018. That's another reason we are asking for council's passage of this resolution this evening. The second is to correct, for example, the name of the school district. Uh, it's not just the Lakewood City School District, it's the Board of Education of the Lakewood City School District. So we've made those um, modifications to this agreement and as a result of those modifications, we have to come to you tonight with a substitute version of docket item number three. Um,
that explains the modifications since November 20, those two, uh, changing the payment date to the end of January 2018 and correcting the name of the Board of Education. Um, if there are any questions about the substance of the agreement, I'm happy to answer those or perhaps uh, defer to Director Pei. Thank you. Um, well, uh, <clears throat> now, um, given that introduction, I will um, open the floor to council colleagues for questions, uh, and then we'll go through the procedures. Councilman Rader. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so just curious, just looking at this, uh, why so many years of, uh, I guess, not making the full payment. Oh, is it, well, why is it a decade? Is it was this been working now? Was this just, was this just discovered that there was uh, this this kind of uh, shortfall? Uh, two or actually a couple things were going on. Okay. Uh, first of all, the project was supposed to be completed in 2009. So as you can see from this, uh, the city was making payments per the agreement. Um, as we all know, since 2009, the project did not really end or finish until uh, around this time, so it's essentially eight years delayed. Um, during the past eight years, as you know, within this community, the city has, uh, and the schools, have rebuilt the schools. So the schools have increased their millage. This was not anticipated during uh, when the original TIP agreement was uh, done. So the millage that was put in place, and it's basically on the schools and the city's responsibility that we calculated on this millage, we'd submit it to the schools, they say, yep, they'd send us an invoice, we'd pay the check. Um, or we, we would uh, submit the monies to the schools. And it wasn't until recently that the um, schools caught this in the agreement and we met and talked about this a lot. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is we did not receive the revenue to support the difference um, from the TIP. Since it wasn't developed, it was sitting fallow for so many years, it did not, and we know that we had the uh, real estate crash that uh, happened beginning in 2007, 2008. We weren't getting the value that was anticipated. Uh, so initially it was about a 30, around $35 million anticipated project that was supposed to kick in in 2009. Right now, it's about a $19 million project that will start seeing that value uh, beginning in 2018-2019. Uh, so it was just both parties um, with dealing with the circumstances that we have and then when it was brought to the city's attention that, hey, this is what you agreed to, we worked to come to an agreement. I did. Thank you, uh, Director Pei. And uh, I had talked to the school board a little bit about it, and uh, I'm very happy to be a part of making them whole. So this is good. So thank you. Thanks. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, uh, I move to substitute. I'm sorry, Councilman Bullock. So are we indeed being asked to adopt this tonight? We are. Okay. Uh, the um, just so I'm clear, uh, Director Pei, the affordability of what we're agreeing to is is what? I mean, is this uh, going to be coming from the general fund or is it rather we're capturing new receipts as the, I think you partly answered the question in your your, your recent answer, but I, I want to make sure I'm clear. Um, the, as this property's development is completed, uh, there's a significantly increased tax valuation and uh, new payments come in the TIF agreement underlying it governs where those go, and we're saying uh, a corrected and, and slight, somewhat increased por portion are going to be diverted to the schools. But uh, in terms of the impact on the, the rest of the budget, uh, it's, it's merely us um, allocating the agree, a newly agreed upon portion of new property tax receipts. So many questions there. Um, first and foremost, the general fund will not be supporting any of these payments to the schools. Um, when the TIF was put in place, uh, essentially why you have tax increment financing is you issue debt. Um, and in the case in 2004, the city issued debt uh, to pay for the purchase and demolition of those existing uh, 
car dealerships that were there, and then some uh, infrastructure. So the, the TIF is then you, 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 you waive the value to pay for the debt service in the hopes that in the future that the improvement on the property is going to bring even more revenue. So the two parties that would receive property tax, the city and the schools come to an agreement understanding that we're going to waive um, some property tax revenue in order to do a development to uh, increase value in the future. So that's in a nutshell what uh, tax increment financing is. Uh, so there were two accounts that the, or two funds that the council created at that time. One of the accounts was for the debt proceeds and for to go to the project. The other was to pay the debt back. So the revenue, the, the uh, payments in lieu of taxes, the property tax value that of the increase went into that fund. Uh, so as we said, that the, the fund really didn't match uh, what the uh, um, debt service was until recently. And then, if you recall, in 2016, the city refunded the debt uh, associated with the uh, Rockport project. So from those savings from that project, we're able to get even more dollars into that fund. So that's how we're able to pay for what is owed, um, or a portion of what is owed, not the full value. That's why we're paying $290,000 now. Um, and then we'll catch up in time as the value comes in. But it will come out of that fund. It will come directly from those property taxes related to the project and will not impact the general fund. Thanks. Uh, any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, uh, I move to substitute. Second. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to substitute? Again, these are the two changes uh, that were ministerial in nature that uh, Law Director Butler just mentioned. Hearing none, Madam Clerk. Anderson? Yes. Bullock? Yes. George? Yes. Litton? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. O'Malley? Yes. Rader? Yes. Thank you. Uh, move to adopt. Second. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to adopt? This is as substituted, of course. Hearing none, Madam Clerk. Anderson? Yes. Bullock? Yes. George? Yes. Litton? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. O'Malley? Yes. Rader? Yes. That motion passes. Item four, communication from council members O'Leary, Litton, and Bullock, and Mayor Summers regarding animal control ordinances. Thank you. Mayor Summers. Thank you, uh, President O'Leary, members of council, members of the audience. Acknowledging that Lakewood's, uh, I'll turn my mic on here. Acknowledging that Lakewood's current dog ordinances have proven to be challenging to fully enforce, and in an effort to minimize dog aggression attacks while holding owners accountable, with the undersigned proposed changes to our animal control ordinances, specifically chapters 505 and 506. These changes remove the current ban on certain breeds and improve expectations of responsible ownership while creating stricter consequence on owners for failure to maintain control of their dogs. These changes draw upon the following. Number one, suggestions from Lakewood's Animal Safety Welfare Advisory Board and our own animal control officers recent experiences with dogs and dog attacks, the animal control ordinances of several Ohio cities suggested as benchmarks by the animal support community, which seek to create clearer categories of behavior that escalate with consequences in proportion to threatening behavior. And lastly, Lakewood's uniqueness in terms of the density of uh, people per square mile. Lank Lakewood ranks number 125 out of 19,300 cities in the entire United States in terms of density. One thing is clear, it may be one of the few things we all agree on tonight, <clears throat> is that improved animal safety requires each citizen to assume responsibility to improve their understanding of animal behavior as well as take appropriate action when safety is threatened. Tonight, the undersigned offer improvements to our animal control ordinances as a result of recognizing challenges and trends. We are drawing on the experiences, advice, opinions of our citizens, our professionals, and other communities' approach to these same trends. We recognize that the proposed changes to this existing ordinance are the beginning of the legislative process. We four are not in full agreement regarding every component of the proposed changes and look forward to the legislative process that will follow. We ask that this proposal be referred to the appropriate city council committee for what we believe will result in improved public safety for our community. Respectfully submitted, uh, Sam O'Leary, John Litton, Tom Bullock, and Mike Summers. Thank you. Uh, we do have several folks who are signed up to speak on this issue, uh, so 
we will get right into it. Um, Greg Murray is the first person signed up. Thank you. Um, first off, I, oh, Greg Murray, 1585 Westwood Avenue, Lakewood, Ohio. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, congratulate um, Megan George and Tristan Rader on your historic and amazing uh, wins. Uh, we appreciate everything you bring to the table. I'd also like to congratulate uh, Councilman Litton on your new family dog. It's good to have <laughs> some dogs uh, represented up on council. I bet you didn't expect that today. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, real quick, uh, this photo is of Bailey. She's a kind of corsal mastiff. Uh, we brought her into Lakewood years ago. She passed away, sadly. Uh, she was amazing. Um, in light of some recent proposal uh, that came out Friday, um, uh, proposing that uh, kind of corsals be banned based on looks and not actions, I'd just like to uh, make it clear that I'd go to jail before someone tried to muzzle my dog based solely on the way it looks. That is disgusting. Um, I'd like to reference an email that the mayor sent out to council today um, stating that the muzzle requirement for certain breeds when in public seems to be the most controversial. Rocky River and many communities require this. Um, in a Westlife interview recently, uh, Law Director Andy Bemmer of Rocky River says they don't even enforce these anymore because of the 2012 uh, change in state law when it comes to uh, pits. Um, and in the email, it also said 100, about 100 Ohio cities have restrictions or bans. That is incorrect. It is about 40, give or take a few. Um, so this isn't about blocky headed dogs. This isn't about just Charlie, Macy, Roscoe, Valentina, who happens to be a Lakewood approved pit mix therapy dog at Lakewood High School. It's about common sense laws. It's about safety. It's about respect. It's about being the progressive Lakewood. It's about giving bite victims of any type of dog in Lakewood the respect they deserve by taking safety seriously. It is the city's job to create an environment through many different tools along with residents and avenues that says we mean business when it comes to safety. That, that hasn't happened in 10 years, and we didn't make any headway with Friday's proposal. While portions of the newly proposed ordinance are a huge step forward, they are overshadowed by BSL portions that are inconsiderate, insincere, unfeasible, unwarranted, and pointless. BSL aspects of proposed section 505.25 are unenforceable, unfair, costly, time-wasting, and false sense of safety created even more so than our current ordinance. Safety is not a joke. It is not to be used as a political chess move like the one made this past Friday. This was clearly a political move, maneuver to be first. While someone was whipping together this proposal and without much thought so they could be first, others were coming up with a thoughtful first draft, taking this seriously. Please start treating safety seriously. Sadly, this has turned into a game and safety is not a game to be played with. The proposed ordinance was submitted after two council members' final meeting and just days before two newly elected council's first meeting and on a holiday weekend nonetheless. It is decisions like this that got many people to polls this past November and voted in Megan George and Tristan Rader. Megan and Tristan deserve much better. We deserve much better. Even more of your constituents were alienated with the proposal. You took BSL and moved the city backwards with more forms of BSL. You proposed an ordinance even more difficult to enforce, even more costly, more likely to lead to lawsuits, more time wasting than ever, taking so many resources away from things that equate to safety. It's time the city stopped pointing to our uniqueness when it comes to our dense population. As the mayor just pointed out, Lakewood is 125th most dense city in the United States. Of the 124 dense cities in front of it, do you know how many have uh, restrictions or bans? I did the research, it's about three. So are you saying the 98% of other cities that don't have these don't know what they're doing? Are you saying the Obama administration was silly to come out against BSL? Are you saying multi-billion dollar company State Farm Insurance doesn't know what they are doing when it comes to their no discrimination policy? Are you saying that ASPCA, American Bar Association, and CDC don't know what they're talking about? So let's start 2018 off on the right foot by putting our time, energy, and resources and money into real things that make a difference not unenforceable, costly, time-wasting ordinances that fail to address the real issues. Discrimination has and never will have a home in Lakewood. Safety and common sense laws do. Let's be a model for the country. Let's be better than Avon Lake. Let's not copy them, that's silly. Let's take a look at what they're doing and be better. Continued ignorance of the real problems will not make Lakewood safer, and that is a fact. For 10 years, the city has been going after good residents and good dogs based only on looks. 
This is close to being over. We're all about to cross the finish line with common sense and safety being the winner. Yet some of you are trying to prolong a failed cause, and that is discrimination. BSL is a failed public policy. American Bulldogs and Kane Corsos, I'm running out of time. How the heck they got thrown into this fray is unbelievable. We need <laughs> dog lovers and experts running our animal control. You alienated so many more people this past Friday, and you dug yourself into a bigger hole. Thank, Thank you. you. Our, our next speaker signed up is Kristen Murray. Hello, my name is Kristen Murray. I live at 1585 West Road Avenue. On Friday, we got word that a new dog ordinance proposal was on the docket for this city council meeting. It was immediate excitement. We were driving home from a winter vacation and you should have seen us. We have poured our hearts into making this change and it was finally here. As I scrolled through the proposed ordinance, I felt like we were finally making all the positive changes we were hoping for until I got to section six. My excitement immediately turned to confusion and disappointment. Why would we require pit bull type dogs, American bulldogs, canary dogs, and cane corsos to have additional restrictions? How did this breed list come to be? What references did you review to determine this list? In my line of work, I am required by law to use evidence-based practice. If I don't, I would lose my license to practice. This is not only the best practice, but this is the practice that I feel best about morally. If this is how we practice in our professional careers, why would we treat our local legislation any different? Why would we intentionally identify certain breeds as needing additional restrictions when they have shown no harm? Can you explain to me how our Cane Corso, can everybody just take a look at this face? This face has been all over the world, okay? Every country has seen Bailey's face. How has our Cane Corso, Bailey, who passed away in 2014, any different from our neighbor's golden retriever? Based on the American Temperament Test Society, they are nearly the exact same. Based on a 10-step temperament test, Cane Corsos actually passed at 86.5%, while Golden Retrievers passed at 85.4%. 106 days ago, I stood in this exact place. I challenged each of you to visit the Cuyahoga County Animal Shelter. I asked you to go sit with a pit. I asked you to talk to the volunteers. I asked you to do your own research. For those of you who signed your name on this proposal, I am wondering how many of you took one hour out of your lives since September to drive down to Valley View to do this. I'm going to assume that it wasn't one of you. So I stayed again, just as I did in September, Singling out a dog or breed that has been nothing but well-behaved is not the inclusive and progressive Lakewood that I know exists. Can we please not have a repeat of 2008? Let's please just get this right now so we do not need to revisit this ordinance again. Let's replace this ordinance with fair, breed-neutral ordinances that hold all dogs and all owners responsible, not only pit bull-type dogs, American bulldogs, Canary dogs and Cane Corsos. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ken McCourt. Thank you. Um, I'm Ken McCourt. I live in Doylestown, Ohio, 320 Eastern Road. I'm a professional animal trainer and a behavior consultant. I work in this area um, all over Northeast Ohio. I have been for 30 years now. In fact, I've seen three clients uh, within 10 miles of here just in the last two weeks. Um, most of the clients that I see, um, their dogs would probably be called nuisances by this ordinance that you're looking at. Uh, first off, I wanna congratulate you, big improvement on the original breed-specific legislation, but still not going far enough. Uh, first off, the idea that there's a breed of dog out there goes back to eugenics, World War II, doesn't exist. The scientific community, community right now can tell you 
There was no founder golden retriever out there or Cana Corso or any other one. And if you guys make up names for breeds, people will go out and augment the dog's look slightly and give it another name and then you'll have to write more ordinances. So first off, they're called land races in biology. They don't call them breeds. The word breed is associated, it's, not a, it's a made up term. It doesn't exist in science. Actually, the word that belongs there in a phylogenetic chart is race. And just like there's no pure race of people out there, there's no pure race of dogs either. Um, first off, aggression. I keep seeing this word coming up, and aggression is not a personality trait in an animal. It's a way they behave. It's part of a bigger group of behaviors called agonistic behaviors. And agonistic behaviors are interactions between one or two animals, or possibly more. And it has to do with uh, everything from submissive behavior, and there's active and passive submission, all the way up to aggressive behaviors, there's active and passive aggression. Um, you haven't addressed any of that in this legislation. It looks to me like it was written by lawyers and not scientists. Um, the second thing is that um, um, agonistic behavior is, is about the animal's ability to control their arousal state. That has to do with brain chemistry and, and learning patterns in the animal. It has nothing to do with their breed. Okay, the other part of it is that uh, the motivation for the animal to uh, do something that we might call aggressive has a lot to do with learning in the animal and not to do with their breed or what they look like. Um, we stopped the, the whole idea of eugenics and the way animals looked uh, went out of vogue with people that actually had real working dogs, which we don't really have anymore, um, 200 years ago. And we're still bringing it up in these kind of of uh, um, talks. So anyhow, the other part that I'm concerned about uh, with your new legislation is that you talked about uh, animals that were classified as dangerous as somehow going to a basic obedience training program or seeing a behavior modification specialist. Well, first off, those two uh, fields are non-regulated. I see dogs after dogs after dogs whose behavior problem is directly related to somebody they paid money to to train them in really bad techniques. So just to say they're going to go out and get a certification from some trainer that could just hung up their shingle yesterday, and they're going to say that this animal somehow, because it responds to cues, is now safe in the general public, is a pipe dream. That is not how it works. Real behavior modification takes time. Uh, the clients that I see, which are very, very dedicated to their animals, they're responsible people, they wouldn't be taking them out in the general public, especially if they were considered uh, in, by this legislation as a nuisance animal. Um, I do see animals that would be considered dangerous by this group as well, and under the right conditions and the right uh, uh, program designed for the particular individual dog, um, they're no longer dangerous. So we need to really think more about putting some science into this and stop talking to law directors and lawyers and start talking to people that actually understand uh, something about the science and something about the personality of dogs and why they do what they do. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker signed up is Whitney Callahan. Thank you. My name is Whitney Callahan. I live at 13885 Edgewater Drive. Um, I also own In the Dog House, 1548 West 117th. So I am a homeowner in the city and a business owner in the city. I'd like to thank council for finally opening the discussion about our animal welfare laws. This is a big, big step in 10 years. Uh, we all agree that animal safety and the safety of our community is important, but it is how we determine that and go about that that is really important moving forward. And we want to be progressive in that and meet the needs of our community while addressing the state laws and what is best for everyone. Um, I've been an animal professional for 14 years and I have largely sat on the sideline and observed and supported the changes that are moving forward. Um, I recognize that my business will be scrutinized by my comments, that uh, my livelihood could be affected and that my 20 22 full-time employees could also be affected by my statements, but I felt that it was my civic duty to move forward while we have an opportunity to shape the law. Um, owners should be, and dogs should be, accountable for their actions. There is no doubt about that. Um, however, the suggested ordinance 
while it does not prohibit a breed, it certainly does restrict, restrict specific breeds. And that is in, and I will get legal here, in conflict with Ohio Revised Code Chapter 955, which as a business owner, I fully support. And it exceeds the authority of home rule to the Ohio Constitution because it prohibits that which the state law permits and specifically licenses, according to the Supreme Court. So if we are going to move forward, it cannot be breed specific. It has to be breed neutral. Let's look at the behaviors and create consequences for behaviors of dogs. You're, the first sentence of this letter says, you acknowledge that Lakewood's current dog ordinances have proven challenging to afford, yet we are making them more challenging to enforce. We have added additional breeds, and now we're slipping in some spay neuter mandates. I only have time to talk about a couple things, so we'll just talk about that. Okay, um, I have found that education with my clients is always more important than policing. I educate people on the responsibility of spay and neutering your pet in a, when it makes sense, I especially in a socialized environment. I educate my, my clients about vaccinating their pets, about taking their dogs to dog obedience. And that's what we need to do. We need to educate. We need to dedicate more resources to our densely populated community. The law in the state of Ohio says that regardless of your town or your city, they are standardizing the laws for animal control. It does not say if you're more densely populated than another city, you should have a separate law. Also, let's talk about the restrictions that we're placing. If we're talking about a dog that is a dangerous dog determined by a behavior, then that makes sense there are consequences. However, I will tell you that as someone that observes animal behavior on a daily basis, attends, attends industry conference, requires ongoing education for my staff, that the quickest way to make a dog unfriendly is to isolate that dog and not allow that dog to communicate. Dogs do not communicate verbally like you and I do. They communicate by moving their body by the way they open their mouths and the way their eyes are and the tenseness in their face and their tails and their bodies and the torsos. If you restrict a dog with a muzzle, they cannot communicate. They also cannot socialize. You will wind up that we are creating an atmosphere that is um, less friendly in our community. Dogs that are more dangerous. Instead of preventing issues, you are creating the problem. Let's address the problem when it, when it occurs, not create a problem with friendly dogs. Additionally, I noticed there was a spay and neuter policy that is put in place. At my facility, because we are a socialized facility, I do mandate dogs be spayed or neutered by seven months, which has been the standard. It has been said that early spay and neutering in a shelter environment is recommended. However, more and more pushback is given back to me in, by the veterinary community and by my clients. Dogs, it has been shown scientifically, um, have maybe a higher chance of cancer if they are spayed or neutered too early. Larger breeds in particular can develop health problems. I have a bull mastiff. She's not on your list yet. Perhaps she may be. I don't know, this is a slippery slope. However, I did have her spayed at six months because she's, we're in a socialized environment, and I've replaced two of her ACLs. I don't know if that's convinced, if I'm not sure if that is the reason. However, by PetMD, by Mer American Veterinary Council, by VetMD, it certainly could be a contributing factor, the fact that I did spay my dog at that age. There's people here that are breeders. There's people here that show their dogs. They're hunting. There are people that hunt with their dogs. There are people that potentially could have service dogs. They won't know that by four months of age. I may have a small breed that's too young to spay or neuter. It may be less than five months. Putting a dog under anesthesia at less than five months is a very dangerous thing. Before we mandate something, that uh, creates additional restrictions that will be very difficult to enforce. How are you going? Are you going to knock on my door to see if I've spayed my dog at four months? Are you going door to door? Because right now we're having a problem picking up strays off the streets. 
Was this created because we have a big, spa, uh, big stray population? I don't think so. I used to sit on the board of CLAWS. We don't have that many dogs in there. We have more cats. So let's cre create a ordinance when we have an issue and educate people. Promote education. Incentivize people to spay and neutering. Maybe that means that, uh, and, the, and the state allows that. In fact, they've allowed for there to be lower costs to license your dog if your dog is spayed or neutered. Incentivize people to take their dogs to dog trainers. Uh, increase dog education, uh, interaction, community safety. Teach your children not to approach strange dogs that they don't know. This is an opportunity. Let's take the opportunity to be thoughtful, to move forward, to create breed neutral laws to address behaviors. Let's work together, okay? Let's not close the door and write a quick ordinance to close a lawsuit. Let's do what's important and what's right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Our next speaker signed up is uh, Jennifer Scott. Good evening and Happy New Year. Megan George and Tristan Rader, congratulations and welcome. I stood before you last July, days after Charlie got loose. I accepted full responsibility and I took the proper steps to be sure it didn't happen again. You know, responsible ownership type things. I stood before you and I implored you to comport with the Ohio Revised Code. Imagine my elation when I heard the news. I felt like I'd won the lottery. But then I kept reading. I was shocked and sickened and saddened. It is still BSL. It is still discrimination. It is in no way, shape, or form a way to treat a well-behaved dog. I cannot fathom doing these things to my dogs. Tether, muzzle, why? Well, I'm sure some of you would like to muzzle me. It's clear that the majority wants me to continue to help put an end to discrimination. A reporter today congratulated me on my win. I'm not fighting this to win. I'm fighting for all dogs to be treated equally, to end BSL, to get laws on the books that hold owners responsible, laws that are fair and equitable for all dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica England, I think. Um, first, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to allow me to come and speak to you. This is the first time I've ever done this, so a little nervy. Um, but I wanted to um, come and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have trained, shown, and bred AKC registered boxer dogs for 18 years. I have volunteered with Boxer Rescue for five years and placed hundreds of rescue dogs in loving homes. I recently, and you guys may have seen the AKC National Championship show on Animal Planet last night, um, I recently had the opportunity to attend that show and participate in it. It's a big show. It's the biggest national show in the entire United States for the sport of, pur of purebred dogs. There were 5,000 dogs entered, and of those dogs, one of my boxer puppy bitches actually took, her, took reserve winner's bitch at this national show. Part and parcel of showing purebred dogs is keeping them intact. The purpose of dog shows is to evaluate breeding stock objectively against a breed standard that is set forward by the American Boxer Club and adopted by the American Kennel Club. That breed standard gets specific down to the exact angle of the shoulder in which the bones come together and they meet to ensure that the dog can do what it was purpose bred to do. My breed is a working breed. I disagree that working breeds no longer work because I've created therapy dogs. I have 
competed with them at shows in obedience and confirmation, and I've had them evaluated by some of the top um, police canine officers from around the world for their temperaments. I also temperament test them, I health test them. Any dog that I breed has to maintain such a high standard that very few of them actually make it that far. I've produced one litter in 18 years. I am very, very picky about the quality of dogs that I produce and the homes that I put them into. My contracts come with a $10,000 penalty for breach of contract for failure to spay and neuter a pet that I place on limited registration, and I enforce those. As a result, no dog that I have ever produced has ever ended up in a shelter situation. Therefore, I do not contribute to the pet population problem, and therefore should not be held to that same standard. I shouldn't be forced to cover or clean up other people's messes when they have, and I believe that my role in providing education, as Whitney rightly pointed out, is a much stronger mechanism for reducing unwanted pets throughout the United States. For all of the dogs that I've produced, I've helped save 10 more through rescue. This is a labor of love, make no mistake about it. We lose more money than we make. Um, my current puppy bitch that I went to Florida with, um, I have $10,000 into her over the course of the last six months. It's a very expensive sport. Many people joke that the only sport that's more expensive is, is horses. Um, my last litter cost me $8,000 with imported semen from Canada. Um, I only recouped 2,100 of that. So if I were in this, to run a business, I'd be making the stupidest business decision <laughs> of my life. The problem with mandatory spay and neuter is as a breeder, it puts me in a very poor situation. It basically says that in order to maintain my household, I have two dogs right now, three is my limit. I am not allowed to place dogs on co-ownerships in responsible homes and then thereby show them and later breed them if they meet the quality of my standards because by doing so, I would be asking them to break the law. That's a problem for me. Likewise, as been stated, pediatric spay and neuter has been shown to be unhealthy in some studies, and you'll hear more about that later. It does not work as a one-size-fits-all measure. If you think about a tiny chihuahua, she may come into her first season around four months. It's not so with the larger breeds. Essentially, when you are spaying and neutering them at that young age, you are cutting them off from ever going through the hormonal changes of puberty, and we can all imagine what happens in humans when that, if we were to do that. I realize that there's a qualified breeder clause. However, I have big concerns that it could easily be removed. While I'm protected now, I don't like the idea that I may not be protected in the future. I believe that low-cost spay and neuter clinics are another option along with rather than coercing people into obeying the law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Sandy Iwasco. I'm sorry if I mispronounced the last. Good evening. My name is Sandy Iwasco. I live at 2364 Northland Avenue. I just found out about this last night. Unfortunately, um, as some others have noted, it was just pushed through very quickly and rather abruptly. Um, so you'll have to um, please bear with me since I do not have the notes that some of these people do and have so eloquently spoken for our dogs. I, in the past 15 years, have had the warm, fuzzy kind of dog that everybody loves. It's a Portuguese water dog, all right? You think they're cute and they're just lovely little curly things. They are, but they are dogs. And they, and I have to disagree again, as Jessica did, I have a working breed. I've had the great honor of having four of them in my life. Two of them have now passed. Um, one, the first one was Marina and I'm gonna get into the health things. I was an uneducated owner because I'm allergic to dogs. 
This is the only breed that I can actually touch, play with, cut their hair, give them baths, so forth and so on, which I truly love to do. I, like Jessica, want to breed dogs. Um, I have never bred a, bred a litter in my life yet. I right now have a ton month old bitch who is intact and will remain intact because I have a contract with her breeder that I cannot break that states that she must stay intact until she's at minimally 18 months old and then she has the ability to tell me if I can or cannot spay her. So, Marina, let's start with her. I had her spayed at 11 months old. I was an uneducated owner. She was my first dog. She became incontinent at two years old. I had to put her on meds. She lost her muscle mass in her rear legs. Chiropractic work, continual acupuncture, and everything else I had to do to exercise her and stretch her every morning to keep her from hurting. She was a working dog. She worked till two to three weeks before she died. And actually on my Facebook page, she died in 2014. You can see her three weeks before she died, still playing fetch in my backyard. Again, in pain. My second dog, Misty, she was spayed at three and a half years old. I lost her hemantial sarcoma, which is one of the diseases that actually, if you do a late spaying, which I had to for medical reasons. She was, she, had, she ended up dying to hemangial sarcoma. It is one of the unfortunate things if you do a late spay, it actually raises the risk of it. Um, I have a two and a half year old male. He was neutered two and a half weeks ago. His testicles didn't drop. Lost out on that breeding too. Okay, so now I have a 10 month old bitch. I'm doing everything to possibly have her bred. Um, I am an engineer, I'm detail oriented. I have been training dogs for 15 years, so has my husband. We train at Cleveland All Breed Training Center. So, most of us that do training and have working dogs will not spay or neuter our dogs until they are at least gone through one season or the males in the similar breed mature at that, about that same age, minimally 18 months, because we end up with joint disor disorders. I'm sure a lot of you heard of hip dysplasia in dogs. What you're basically doing is removing any possible growth, muscle mass buildup. You are taking basically, we'll use a boy for example, a 13 year old boy and just ripping his you know what's off. What does a boy look like at 18 and 21 versus 13? Big, muscular, grown, grew six more inches, went from a size 32 waist to a 36. His <clears throat> chest is now, you know, 46. They're, they grow. You now do, do the same thing to a dog. You basically just ended their growth pattern, which means that every time they move, they are hurting. Their joints, muscles, nothing is holding together because it hasn't grown. Along with that are cancers, and I know I'm running out of time. And if I may, if I could address you guys, I made five copies. Um, this is a study, and it wasn't just a study of a bunch of rich dogs at the University um, of California. Um, so forth and so on. It was 90,000 dogs. And you can see the difference of the spaying and neutering between males and females from a lot of cancers. And their months of age, they get to live two months, two years longer, three years longer, six months longer, <clears throat> which is a long time for us. When we lose our dogs, the six extra months would have mattered. So I'm asking you to please really take a good look at the spay neuter item you have in there and please address it, if I may. Sure, if you wanna um, just hand those over to our um, legislative assistant. Oh, no worries. You did great. Thanks so much. Uh, our next speaker signed up is, um, and I feel like I'm gonna mispronounce this one too, but Carla uh, Borkelt? Borkelt? Not even in the ballpark, am I? Sorry. Borschelt. All right. Carla Borschelt, 14977 Lakewood Heights Boulevard, Lakewood, Ohio. I've sat in this room many, many times over the years. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Councilman George, Councilman Rader. Uh, I'd like to thank the two of you and probably Councilman O'Malley for pushing this ordinance 
to where we are today, probably. Um, try to keep it short and sweet because there's a lot of people talking. I do want to kind of piggyback. She said she lost six months with her dog. I lost four because she was misidentified as a pit bull um, several years ago. DNA ultimately um, allowed her to come back, but I cannot for a second believe that a few percentage points either way <laughs> would make her a vicious dog, and it was her appearance only that kicked her out of the city for four months. Um, she's now a therapy dog, and we work at Lakewood High School on a weekly basis, but we also do nursing homes, college campuses, <coughs> uh, after school programs, et cetera. So I just have a few questions to pose on some of the proposed uh, legislation here, um, specifically adding more breeds to the list. If breed determination is already a subjective thing and it's you know determined by who's checking the emails that day, if we're sending in pictures from animal control to be approved, how does adding more breeds to that list make it easier to enforce? And furthermore, I'm sure there are families in this city who work to comply with the ban that was in place and opted to adopt or purchase a Cane Corso or an American Bulldog. I know we predominantly have fostered American Bulldogs over the years because they were legal and having gone through what we went through, um, what Charlie, Jennifer are going through now, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So I would have never brought another dog into the city that I thought would not be legally allowed to live here. And now I'm sure there are several here that will be faced with BSL restrictions that are even almost as difficult to, to abide by as a ban. Um, so my question is that, how, how do the additional breeds being added to the restricted list affect the families currently in compliance under the ban? <clears throat> what will the process be to determine breed? Will an owner, is it still, it's DNA is still gonna be a thing? Um, which isn't always 100%. Uh, will an owner have to look at their dog and determine that that dog is dangerous or vicious just by having them sit in the kitchen? Um, it just doesn't seem fair to look at your dog and say, oh, you're vicious, I have to go tell the city now. Uh, the proposed changes still place judgment on appearance, not behavior. How will muzzling a well-mannered or properly managed dog in public ensure public safety. Uh, I was walking my 14-year-old dog who had recently been diagnosed with cancer down my street, and he was attacked by a probably a 30 or 40-pound little shepherdy mixy thing. I wouldn't even guess to determine what his breed was because he wasn't properly contained. So my senior dog was attacked on leash because someone else didn't contain their dog. Don't think my dogs, no matter what they look like, should have been wearing the muzzle in that situation. Um, what additional steps will be taken to hold negligent owners accountable for nuisance or dangerous behavior? Behavior, not appearance. And then just to wrap up real quickly, reading Mayor Summers' communication he sent in, I wrote down a quote, improved animal safety requires each citizen to assume responsibility to improve their understanding of animal behavior, but animal control only needs to guess what breed they are. That doesn't seem, <laughs> doesn't seem logical or fair. So that's my two cents. It's been a long, many years coming, so thank you for your time. Thank you. That brings us to our final speaker signed in on this item, and that speaker, uh, and again, apologies for name mispronunciations, is Ben Cheese Glenn. And I know that you've been up to speak before as well, so I apologize for uh, mispronouncing it a second time. Ventus. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of Lakewood City Council, and Happy New Year to each of you. Uh, my name is Ventus Glenn, and I am actually a citizen of Lakewood's neighboring community, Ohio, uh, Ohio City. I'm at 4424 Franklin Boulevard. Uh, I think it was July that my father, my fiance, and I first spoke before you regarding Lakewood's breed restrictions that have kept my fiance and I from purchasing a home in your city. Uh, first and foremost, I have to say I was surprised and pleased to hear that the ban on uh, specific breeds has been 
and I believe the verbiage was effectively ended in Lakewood today. Um, further, I am glad that continued discussion has been opened up by the council to move forward with making additional progressive changes to Lakewood's dog ordinances. Uh, upon reading through the original proposed changes found online in the docket for today's meeting, uh, I was happy to see that there is a stronger focus on holding owners accountable for their dogs. Uh, in addition to, you know, the addition of the nuisance dog classification, the required posting signs for homes that harbor nuisance and dangerous dogs, as well as required behavior modification courses it is a very strong step in the right direction for holding owners accountable for their pets and thereby creating a safer community. Uh, this progress is impressive, but it is not enough. Uh, though I understand that these steps may not have been easy for some of you to concede to, the proposed changes to the dog ordinances stop short of complete fairness and equality. Uh, as a proud owner of a mixed breed dog who has been characterized as a pit bull, uh, I want my dog and I to feel truly welcome in the city of Lakewood. However, the new section 505.25 titled additional restrictions for certain breeds makes it clear to me that my dog and I are not welcome here. Although the proposed changes removes the legislation that automatically classified pit bulls as dangerous and banned them outright, uh, based on this new selection of legislation, it is clear that these breeds will continue to be treated as dangerous by the city of Lakewood. In fact, the requirements for harboring a dog that has been labeled dangerous by the, thri by the city through its exhibited behavior and the requirements for harboring a dog that is considered a pit bull based on physical characteristics are nearly entirely identical. But my question is this. If my dog is no longer classified as dangerous, then why would he be subjected to the same restrictions as a dog that has, without provocation, caused injury to a person that, or killed another dog? Why would my not dangerous dog have to be muzzled when we go for a walk? Why would my dog require a specific height of fencing? And what was most upsetting to me, and I apologize if my understanding of this part of the legislation is incorrect, why would I, a responsible dog owner whose dog has never exhibited any of the behaviors outlined under the definitions of a dangerous dog, not be allowed to own more than one of these certain breeds, while owners whose dogs of other breeds who have exhibited such behaviors are not faced with any such limitations. All of this for a breed that you are now saying is not dangerous. Ladies and gentlemen, progress cannot simply halt with the end of the breed ban. While I do applaud the council for opening up the discussion and for the role in removing the legislation that outrightly bans certain breeds, it is time to remove all breed-specific restrictions and regulations from Lakewood and fully welcome, with equal enthusiasm, all responsible dog owners and their pets into your city. My fiance and I still want to become Lakewood residents this year, and one day we hope that we'll actually feel welcome to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, that brings us to the end of our docket comment for uh, the communication, which is item number four. Uh, before we open it up to council members to address the communication as well, uh, I will move to receive and file the communication. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to receive and file. Discussion on the motion to receive and file the communication. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, start. Councilwoman George. Thank you, uh, thank you. Um, I wrote down a few comments just so I can make sure I addressed all of it. And well, I can uh, I can appreciate the fact the administration, along with a few members of council, who have up until now never acknowledged the need to revamp the current BSL legislation, have conceded to the fact that change is needed. Unfortunately, what has been presented here is still breed-specific legislation. Although the ban on pit bulls has been removed. The labeling and singling out of this breed, as well as, as well as expanding the listing of breeds as dangerous or vicious, does in fact expand breed-specific legislation. This proposal puts additional burden on Lakewood residents who have breeds such uh, who have these breeds. Uh, those burdens include muzzling and building of special structures to house them. As someone who campaigned against and believes in eliminating BSL, I cannot in good conscience proceed with allowing this proposed ordinance to go further. Lakewood, we can do better. City Council, we can do better. And I urge my colleagues who believe in the removal of BSL to join me in voting no on this proposed ordinance. We can work collectively on a much better proposal that will not single out breeds, but will take a hard line look at the entirety of this issue and propose something that in the end does remove BSL. In the end, we want to save our Lakewood, and I think we can do it with putting together a better ordinance. We could do better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank 
Councilman, Councilman Rader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just have a, a couple questions, actually, uh, because uh, some of the speakers, fantastic speakers, thank you. Uh, one is, too, uh, Carla, I would like to get a copy of your list of questions. I want to make sure that we get all of those answered fully. Uh, I know that you were furiously writing. I was not, so I apologize, but I want to get a list of that. I think you had it written down, right? Okay, good. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Butler, does this, does this current law that, that's proposed co comply with Ohio Revised Code? Uh, the, 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 law that is, the, the law that was submitted by the mayor. Uh, law Director Butler. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I fully believe that this ordinance, if adopted, comports with the revised code. Okay. Uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, secondly, do you, uh, or Mr. Mayor, you might be a, a better able to answer this. Uh, was the actual uh, Board of Animal Control and Safety and Control uh, consulted on this? Uh, and when, when did that happen? I guess I went to the last meeting. I, I didn't hear this brought up. In fact, I, I heard that they were anxious to get to work um, on, on, on this ordinance that was, was being introduced. I was wondering when that conversation with the, that board happened. Mayor Summers. You want to do interrogatory here, Mr. President? I mean, it's not our custom, but I'd be happy to answer that one directly. Oh, yeah. the, uh, the answer is I did meet with the Lakewood Animal Safety Advisory Board on two occasions. We, we uh, on, uh, for several hours, they uh, offered their views of uh, ordinances. In fact, I'm, uh, one of the things I, I think it's important to recognize, 506, uh, which was not mentioned much here, which is the heart and soul of, I think, the animal uh, control and responsible owner accountability piece, comes from discussions with the Lakewood Animal Safety Advisory Board. They offered several uh, uh, recommendations of ordinances from other cities, and I took those and, and spent uh, several months scrutinizing them. I would also like to say that many have commented this is a rush to judgment. I've sat here and listened very carefully to every comment, taken notes every time for every speaker, as I did tonight, thoughtfully reflected on all that, that's at play here for the last seven months. So in responding and listening to seven months, uh, and also recognizing the changes that have been imposed by the state of Ohio, uh, court rulings that have happened elsewhere, uh, our own challenges to uh, breed identification, which we I certainly acknowledge here, uh, <clears throat> all that compels the action tonight. Now, this is a first step. The idea that this is a rush to judgment is, is an inaccurate statement. This is how legislation happens here. We listen carefully, we work hard, we talk to folks who are engaged, as I have done, I take their input, as I did, and we looked and benchmarked several other cities, talked to uh, law directors and mayors of these other cities, and, um, and have put together the ordinance that, by and large, we see today. Now, is it perfect? No. No ordinance of this complexity and this emotional dimension is going to be right the first time out of the gate. There are several elements that we knew would be controversial. I certainly acknowledge that. And we heard most of our discussion tonight about one of them. So the balance in this community, and many of you discount the importance of, uh, of population density, is we have a lot of people living in a very close amount of space. We have to work hard to live and, and uh, live well together, and we have to be respectful of that. And that takes hard work. And that takes the hard work of an ordinance such as we're talking about here tonight. I'm certain we can improve this ordinance. But this is the beginning of the conversation. Our letter acknowledged that. Uh, and uh, however long it takes us to address it is however long it takes. Uh, but the fact that it's a rush to judgment would be uh, incorrect and, and, and a basically a discourteous uh, comment to the effectiveness of how legislation happens here in Lakewood. And we're beginning that process. So we have solicited input from lots of other cities, as many of which were directed, our Animal Safety Advisory Committee. Uh, gave me lots to work with, gave me advice, especially on spay and neutering. Uh, they highly recommended that as a responsible ownership piece. Uh, they gave me draft ordinances from several cities, much of which you see uh, in, uh, in 506 in particular and about half of 505. Uh, very good. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that, that comment. I'm sorry about the protocol. I'll, I'll, I'll get used to it here <laughs> shortly, but thank you for that comment. Um, yeah, and, and just to my comments about, about this ordinance that this is the first, obviously, I've seen it, but I'm very new. Uh, so th uh, thank you. And it is, um, I do actually like a lot of it, uh, all the way up until section 
uh, five, the spade and neuter needs a lot of work. Uh, section six, I, I, this is why I don't believe this is a good starting point because it is breed specific. And I mean, this is something that we've, I think, dealt with. And that, that's the problem here. This is a breed specific ordinance to replace a breed specific ordinance. And I think the only extra thing that I would add uh, to this discussion right now, because I think we, a lot of people brought up a lot of concerns that have been brought up a lot of times. And, and I've heard you, and I think people are starting to hear you now, which I think is great. Um, uh, what I will add is the, and maybe it's because, I, and as I look out here, I don't see too many uh, people of uh, varying skin tones. I see a few, Leonard, Rico, uh, but um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, and I think that, that this ordinance is not just dog discrimination, but it, it gets down to a deeper problem, and I brought it out during the campaign. I think that breed, uh, the breed discrimination laws, uh, at least a long time ago, <laughs> in the 80s, right, and then all the way up through the 2000s, a lot of cities were adopting these laws to target African Americans, and I think that did happen in Lakewood in a few occasions at the very least, um, some of which have, have, were settled out of court. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that we know and we keep in this conversation, this isn't just about dogs, this is about people, this is about discrimination, and, and I will not, I will never vote, even to pass something to a committee. All right, that's what we're voting on today, is to pass this to a committee. I won't even vote to pass this to a committee. I'm not going to vote for a racist law to replace a racist law. Mr. I will Chair. not do that. Thank Mr. You. President. <clears throat> Sorry, Councilman Bullock. Uh, Mr. Rader, you are now a city councilman. You're an elected official. And to make charges and inflammatory comments alleging racism is not responsible. So I excuse hope me. that you excuse will me. Excuse me, provide members, evidence. Oh. Excuse me, I'm sorry. To excuse me, sir. Your colleagues, and to the police chief, and to the administration, to back up what you just said. I do not think it's accurate. If there's evidence to review, I'll be happy to read that evidence. I don't think that's accurate at all. I don't think that's a responsible comment. And I hope that you reconsider that kind of inflammatory and irresponsible rhetoric. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the discussion tonight. Um, first of all, Happy New Year. Welcome, everybody. And um, thank you for uh, continued... I'm sorry. We really... I, I'm sorry to interrupt, issues. Councilman Bullock. We really need folks to be respectful. It's really the fundamental building block for this whole conversation. We've had great discussion so far and a lot of feedback from the audience, and we want to continue that. We have to do it respectfully. Thanks. Thank you. I, um, um, after this docket item um, about uh, reconsidering and revising the, the dog safety laws of our city, number six is a very exciting uh, ordinance. I think it is important, though, uh, a proposal that I've put on the docket about light pollution, which has created some problems in neighborhoods uh, around the city. Um, what I've proposed in item number seven is a starting point. In this case, I have not um, had the time, nor have I taken it upon myself to, uh, from the first draft, figure everything out that needs to be considered for that light pollution ordinance. I consider the same thing to be true for the dog law here, uh, echoing what the mayor said. In other words, this is a starting point. There's a, a famous comment about people who love uh, laws and people who love sausage should not watch the process of it being made because it can be uh, stomach churning. I, I think that's some of what we're encountering here tonight. Um, but uh, I think, you know, my, my um, um, interpretation of this uh, opening discussion is this is an invitation by city council to work together with the community to uh, revise and reconsider. Um, it's clear from the input tonight that uh, uh, there are a number of key points and objections that um, the people in the dog community have tonight, taking some notes on those. Uh, I don't know that um, all of us will agree, but I think that there's two doors that we can go through. One is the negotiate, have, have civil and rational discussion. The other door is the my way or the highway door. Uh, that is often used in Washington, D.C. by the Tea Party and by radical right-wing extremists and the like. I hope we don't do that. I think what we are inviting people to do tonight is to uh, work together. Um, to me, the laws will only work if we do some of the very things that, that uh, many have talked about. 
hold owners responsible, design an ordinance to uh, make that clear and to make that the linchpin of effectiveness. Number two, to educate. And to educate really is going to require the dog community to be a full and, in fact, probably the leading partner in all of this. So um, it, it's not going to be, uh, as we've heard in the discussion here, uh, our animal safety control officers alone who um, can educate 52,000 people and uh, you know thousands of dog and, and animal owners. So it's going to have to be something that um, that uh, that uh, the ownership community buys into. And then finally, um, best practices should, should certainly be included. Uh, I think that some research has gone into including those, and I think that what we're hearing from some of the speakers tonight is that you don't agree that those are best practices. Well, the city's going to have to uh, sort through the different views. There was a dispute tonight in this room in the discussion about whether a breed exists or not. And breeders think it does, and the, the behavior specialists think it doesn't. It, it doesn't. Uh, so we're going to have to work through some of those things. Um, but um, I don't. I don't. I don't think that there's a need to um, view this as a failed ordinance or a, or a uh, you know references were made about trust earlier in the in the in the council meeting. I don't think there's any need for that. I, I view it as an invitation to. Uh, begin the discussion. And if it turns out that there is no uh, ability to uh, get support from the dog ownership community, probably the ordinance fails and then the existing law stays. I don't know if that's the outcome people are looking for. So I'm open to uh, working on this issue and I hope that you are too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Mr. Murray, please. We were respectful and listened. We'd ask that you do the same. Other council members? Councilman O'Malley. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the, the process going forward. Uh, I know we have some folks here tonight who said that this is their first council meeting, uh, first speaking or first attending. Um, assuming that this ordinance is referred to a committee, um, it, this really is the, the starting point for it. If it's sent to a committee, we'll have the opportunity. I am assuming it'll go to the Public Safety Committee. I've had the privilege of chairing that committee for the last a couple of years. Um, we'll hear uh, from a lot, from members of the public, from experts, from uh, our police department uh, and other members of the administration. Uh, there's a lot that I have yet to learn about this. I, I must confess I know nothing about the science around spaying and neutering, and I've, everything I know about it I've learned here listening tonight. So um, I, I, I want to have that opportunity to learn more to improve this ordinance, we w which we will have ample opportunity um, to do. Um, I've said many times on the record that I'm opposed to breed-specific laws, and I, I still am, and I don't want to um, belabor that. Um, one of the main issues that I have uh, with the current ordinance uh, that's in place, as well as with uh, the one that is proposed, were touched on by uh, Ms. Borschelt, and that is the a concept of visually identifying breeds, which I do not believe uh, can be done in any way that is respectful of sound science. Um, I have uh, stated at council meetings in the past, and I forwarded on to my council colleagues and the mayor, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a dozen uh, academic studies, which show that not just the person on the street, but animal control officers, veterinarians, breeders, groomers, trainers are, it's, it's a crapshoot in terms of being able to look at a dog and saying, that's a pit bull. Um, you know, obviously you have a lot of mixed breeds and I more so, or, or just as much I would say than the principle of breed specific laws are my concerns about enforceability in that regard. Um, but um, again, I do, uh, very much look forward to talking about this. There's a lot, as has been said by many members of the public tonight, there are a lot of elements of the proposal which I actually like, um, uh, some, some things that I don't, but uh, again, look forward to uh, having a thorough uh, discussion about this and moving forward and, and making improvements uh, uh, from here on out. 
Thank you. Uh, other council members, comments on the motion to receive and file? Councilman Anderson. Yes, Mr. President. I think that the current ordinance before us, the proposed ordinance, is a great starting point for a legislative process, as has, has been mentioned already. And we're all, we all have an equal say into that process. I mean, we've all attended committee hearings for committees to which we're not assigned, and we've had impact on the legislative process. We've seen this time and time again with pieces of legislation and proposed ordinances. Uh, before this body referred to committee and then worked on and then referred out. I've analyzed much data, not everything, regarding vicious dog bites. And I've spoken with many, including some in this room, uh, to determine how to make Lakewood safe and, and, and to greatly reduce or eliminate vicious dog bites in Lakewood. I've also spoken with some of our neighbors who have been the victims of recent vicious dog bites. And I think that, that needs to be stated out there as well. We do have people in Lakewood, children, adults, and dogs who have been viciously attacked by other dogs in, in the city of Lakewood. That's why this issue is so important to me. I also realize that mostly through the effort of Lakewood residents that perhaps our current ordinance is not as effective as it needs to be or can be. And I look forward to the legislative process to get us there. It's also my plea, however, that we have an honest an honorable conversation and that the legislative, legislative process that follows does not devolve into demonizing, name-calling, and anger, or echoing some racist motivations of the past and, and suggesting that I'm somehow harboring racist motivations for considering this piece of legislation. That's just beyond the pale. And we can do a lot better than that. However, some of the comments and writings that have been expressed tonight and elsewhere have an ominous tone to them. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate the time to make my comments tonight, and I hope that we're not going to have to make additional comments about racist undertones and racist motivations behind the legislative process. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Other folks uh, from council, any comments? We have a, as a reminder, a motion to receive and file the communication is what's before us. Yes. Council, Councilwoman I, George. I think um, my biggest concern is putting this into committee is that there are some good pieces within here. Um, I love that we're um, effectively removing the, the ban on pit bull, that I'm so happy to hear that. Um, but I think, uh, as I mentioned in my other comment, I think we can do better from a starting point. I, I really am not a fan of the um, specifying certain breeds. That, that's the part that makes me uncomfortable. And I understand that does happen during committee. Um, I, in fact, actually wanted to introduce um, something tonight, but I didn't because I wanted to, um, I didn't think the first council meeting was really the time for that. Um, it was the first council meeting. I wanted us to kind of come together a bit, but, but we are where we are. Um, and, and my commitment is to introduce something within the month that that isn't breed specific. And I'd be happy to work with any other colleague here on putting something together. So fundamentally, it's just, it's good. There's pieces of it. I think we can start from a better uh, starting place. Thanks. Uh, any other comments? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts uh, just briefly, although um, we've certainly heard many thoughts tonight and are gonna hear some more. Um, I did sign this letter as an indication that I do feel it's the right time for Lakewood to start this conversation. Uh, contrary, actually, to what you've heard, um, I have always opposed BSL, uh, dating back to 2013, uh, and did so in my subsequent campaign as well. Uh, that position, as far as I'm concerned, remains unchanged. So uh, again, I added my signature to this letter to indicate as many others have indicated, that there's a great deal uh, in this ordinance that I think is appropriate and a great starting point and place to move forward for Lakewood. As has been also said, I think that there are several things that I would like to see changed, including the breed specificity. Um, so we heard again as well tonight on, on some other issues as well relating to spay neuter. I know that there's um, some concerns in some corners, I guess, about microchipping. Um, again, the intent of the legislative process is to air all of this out, to hear from experts and laymen, from council people and residents and business owners and everyone in between what we think is right for Lakewood. And, and that's the, the conversation 
that is before us tonight, and that's why I did lend my name to the letter, and I'm looking forward to the legislative process uh, to work through and hopefully end up with not only a product that makes Lakewood better, um, but also one that garners the support of council. So that's, in my view, the task before us, and that's why I signed the letter, and that's why I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, so that's, uh, those are my thoughts at this point. Uh, again, looking forward to ongoing discussion, to be sure. Um, any other comments or questions? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of receiving and filing the communication, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Abstentions? Hearing none, uh, the motion passes. Item 5, Ordinance 118, an ordinance amending various provisions within Chapter 505, Animals and Fowl, and Chapter 506, Dangerous and Vicious Animals of the Codified Ordinances of the City, in order to update the code with respect to the regulation of dogs in the city. Thank you. Um, I think we went through a lot of the discussion on the communication that would apply to the ordinance, uh, but uh, procedurally, I will move that we, um, well, I'll actually open the floor to uh, council for feedback on which committee, um, if any, to refer this to. Uh, I would suggest public safety, I think, is that's the committee that's taken up the topic in the past, um, but again, I would uh, lay that out on the floor for conversation. Councilman Rader. Yeah, just, uh, I'd spoken with uh, Councilman Litton about how some of these matters go, and sometimes things are referred to Council of the Whole. Would that be an option for this, where we could have probably a, a more kind of diverse discussion where all council members get to vote on the passage of the, I don't know, it's just a thought. I wanted to see what the other council members thought about that idea. Sure. Um, committee of the Whole. Committee is, of the Whole, is the, yes. is the committee. Wow. Um, and, and that's certainly uh, a possibility. We do occasionally refer uh, items to Committee of the Whole, particularly of an economic development nature, um, but sometimes for other reasons as well. Uh, we could certainly consider that. I'll take that to be uh, your preference this evening. Um, I would tend to support a referral to public safety. Um, I think that Committee of the Whole, um, as is evident from our referral list, has a lot in it right now. Uh, to work through, and I do think that we want to uh, have the conversation on this issue, and I think that the most uh, expedient way to do that is in the Public Safety Committee or another committee outside of Committee of the Whole, and um, I also think that the committee meeting process provides just that opportunity for folks to offer amendments, share their feedback and thoughts, um, and that in addition to that, whatever happens in committee will ultimately come back out to council as a whole body. And so um, for that reason, I would tend to support uh, referring it through the, the committee structure as opposed to committee of the whole. Um, but again, it's our collective decision. So yes, Councilman O'Malley. Thank you. Um, my, my preference would be for this to uh, be referred to public safety as well. I still feel like a, a newbie up here, but my uh, brief experience has been that when they're in a committee outside of Committee of the Whole, that you can really um, dig a lot deeper into this. Uh, committee of the Whole, as you mentioned, has quite a full plate. Um, um, and uh, having this in the Public Safety Committee, I think, would be appropriate given the nature of the ordinance and would allow, of course, all council members are welcome at those meetings regardless of committee assignment and uh, would allow that committee to uh, really give this the attention, uh, immediate attention that it deserves. Thanks. Uh, any other comments uh, or questions from council on referral? Hearing none, I would move that we refer Ordinance 1 18 to Public Safety Committee. Second. A uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. That motion passes. Item 6, communication from Council Member Bullock regarding strengthening Lakewood ordinances to limit light pollution. Council Member Bullock. Thank you, Mr. President. I stole my thunder a bit on this uh, issue, and um, but here we go. <clears throat> uh, dear, Mayor, me dear Mayor and members of Council, in both residential and commercial districts, light pollution has created problems for neighbors in multiple areas throughout our city. Lakewood's laws currently do not provide authority for our building inspectors to sufficiently address this problem. 
to improve our ordinances to correct and prevent light pollution, I submit the attached draft for your consideration. This is merely a starting point and several policy considerations must be deliberated upon and balanced to develop a workable policy for our city. For example, what is the threshold that constitutes light pollution? What is a workable prevention and enforcement mechanism and how shall existing light fixtures be addressed? My intent is to convene a series of committee hearings to get input from the public, from council members, from the building department, planning department, and law department. As an attachment to this letter, I have uh, included a summary of research gathered by our legislative liaison, Maureen Bach, on this topic. Thank you, Maureen, for your uh, high quality work on this issue. I request a referral uh, to the committee of council's choosing. Uh, move to receive and file this communication. Sorry. Second. Uh, motion has been made to receive and file that communication. Uh, discussion on that communication. Uh, I will chime in here. Um, so there have been, uh, I think, a number of instances throughout the city that, that we have uh, encountered over our years of service uh, that have indicated that this is an issue, but a couple of them I think are particularly acute and uh, to me has really reinforced uh, the need for such an ordinance. And so I really want to thank Councilman Bullock for his leadership bringing this forward. Um, again, in response to those incidents, I think that we as council members have been able to make good headway on occasion in uh, simply requesting that people be good neighbors. And I think that unfortunately what we are starting to see is that occasionally that is not enough uh, and or that management changes, staffing changes, people forget to turn off the lights, uh, and so this can create uh, a lot of problems um, throughout the neighborhood for, for people's quality of life. Obviously, if you can't sleep, it is rough. Uh, so I, again, I want to thank uh, Councilman Bullock for this, um, and I look forward to the conversation and hopefully uh, getting something meaningful done on that as well. Um, any other comments or questions from Council on the communication? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor of receiving and filing the communication say aye. 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 All those opposed, that motion passes. Item 7, Ordinance 218, an ordinance amending various parts of Chapter 1306, Property Maintenance and Safety Code. Thank you. Um, well, again here, um, I would tend to suggest a housing committee, I think, is the natural uh, place for this, even though uh, in some instances, the offenders are commercial properties. Uh, it's still usually a, a housing-related issue for folks, and so I think there's a pretty tight nexus there, um, and would see that as a suitable committee. But I'm of course open to the suggestions and desires of the rest of council. Uh, so, so moved. Okay. Uh, so we've got a motion. I'll second uh, to refer to housing committee. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? I'm sorry. We have. Thank you for thank you for flagging me down there. It's been a long night. It has, uh, and we've got two more folks to signed up to speak, and I greatly appreciate them being here tonight, and truly uh, want to welcome them up. The first is Mr. William. Is it Bake or Bake? Baker. Baker. I'm sorry. I totally missed the R there. <laughs> uh, My handwriting is not the best. No, it happens. I'm gonna add uh, the R for you. <laughs> William Baker, 1494 St. Charles Avenue. As you spoke earlier, we, there has been management changes. There, it is an issue uh, with technology also, uh, LED lighting, better lighting, uh, you know, the 60 watt or 100 watt light bulb has now changed to a more brighter fixture. Um, we're, we live right next to the post office, the old Fisher Foods. Um, it was built in the 60s, you know, that great facade. Um, <laughs> And we understand the need to light the post office parking lot and safety issues and concerns um, within our city. But to, you know, the lighting issue, there's nothing that can be done um, with being a good neighbor. It, when you have a commercial three property butt up against residential one, it's, it, the city needs better teeth to especially go after, you know, poor installs or just putting slapping something up real quick and easy and it's tough on my family right now and it's and council has been really great we've been emailing you guys back and forth and you guys have gotten back to us and my family in our neighborhood um, to address our concerns and we really appreciate that but 
this ordinance change really does need to happen and we need to look further down the road to see how we can prevent um, light pollution and just annoyances from popping up between, you know, residential, I can't, I can't go to my, you know, I can't go to my post office and talk to the government and say, hey, can you turn your lights off between these hours? It would be awesome. Um, I just hope you guys do make the changes and do uh, get everything taken care of that you need to. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I appreciate uh, your patience uh, and, and comments here this evening. We'll certainly try and get some more prompt results. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is Lindsay Baker. Hi, my name is Lindsay Baker and I live at 1494 St. Charles Avenue. Um, I do first wanna say that um, I wanna thank Mr. Bullock and the mayor for <laughs> the help that they have given us with the post office. Um, but I really would like to speak in support of um, some type of ordinance that would address light trespass and light pollution as a resident who is directly affected by this. Um, for the past two years, my family has dealt with light trespass from the post office. In February of 2016, when I had a two month old and a two and a half year old, the post office decided to install lights that shine directly into our house. Um, no amount of blackout shades or um, any kind of curtains could keep light that out of our bedrooms. Um, the city did step in and they were able to um, at least have them turn off, but we have dealt with pretty much every time daylight savings ends, the post office decides to turn their lights back on. Um, I was really surprised to find that a city that has um, where res residential zoned areas abut commercial areas that there is no type of ordinance for light trespass or light pollution. Um, I think it's a really important um, issue to address now. I do understand the need for businesses like the post office and even residences to have safely light their space. How it's, however, it's unfair um, for a neighborhood to be affected by that lighting. Um, it also shouldn't be something that that business puts up that is cheap or easy just so that they can light and doesn't take into consideration where those lights are being shined. Um, I feel like that any um, ordinance, and this is, comes from also from some of the neighbors, um, there must be a threshold at which constitutes what light pollution and light trespass is and how the city is going to measure and enforce that. Um, it also should not exempt properties from compliance for grandfathering it in. Um, with the post office, there was no type of um, permit pulled. The, we do know that the contractors they used were not even registered in the city. Um, and so for their lights to be grandfathered in by some kind of ordinance would be very unfair to the residents that have protested um, the putting up of those lights since they've happened. Um, this should also apply both to residential and commercial properties, and it also should promote good neighbor, um, good neighbor behaviors with respect to both the community's security and decorative lighting. Um, and as the mayor said earlier, we all have to, we have to work hard to live well together. And I think that needs to apply not only to, um, to neighbors and people that live in our community, but also to the federal government that also, um, they, that should apply to them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, I, I just want to re reiterate my sympathies uh, to those residents who have been contending with that issue. Uh, personally, I've suggested a number of times to the post office that rather than point floodlights out at their neighbors, they could consider putting the floodlights on the perimeter and pointing them in towards their property uh, to no avail. So I, I hope that we can make some strides there and I especially appreciate your points uh, with respect to grandfathering, et cetera, because um, while we do have uh, a code that is thoughtful when uh, new businesses come in and have proposed uh, lighting associated with that. It obviously doesn't cover the situations where there's new lighting or older lighting that was maybe of the softer yellow variety is updated to high intensity blue lighting. Um, so, 
certainly a lot to address and work on, and, and we hope to work through all of those issues. Um, I guess light intensity over distance is measured in something called a foot candle, which isn't something I knew until recently, but there it is. Uh, Director Sylvester's nodding and <laughs> chuckling in agreement. All right, um, so we have, uh, I believe, the motion to refer to housing. Uh, any further comment or question from council or the audience? I got a question on lighting. I didn't sign up, thank you. Um, sure, we can, we can squeeze you in here real quick. Just make sure to um, state your address and name for the My room. name is Edward Schneider. Schneider, I live at uh, 1258 Thoreau Road, right around the corner here. And <clears throat> when you first built your beautiful school on my corner, I went to the superintendent of schools and uh, I said, you built a beautiful place for the kids to play and stay off drugs and everything. And I said, but since you're finally addressing a candlelight ordinance, which is not really what I came here tonight for, they shine, could you start off with them shining the stadium lighting on people's houses, maybe away from it, like you just said, yep. onto the field. They said that they took care of the problem. You guys all work here on your way up and there's a game. Look between the houses. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly can appreciate that. I just, um, I do want to clarify that as much as I like to think of the schools as mine, uh, the superintendent and the school board is, is pretty uh, insistent that they're their own thing. So uh, we, have to, we have to work with them, again, as, as friendly neighbors, even on the municipal side of the fence, to make sure that we get, get it right for the residents. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, any other additional comments? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor of referring uh, Ordinance 2-18 to housing say aye. 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 All those opposed, that motion passes. Item 8, communication from Planning and Development Director Sylvester regarding 2018 State Capital Budget Request. Thank you, Director Sylvester. Thank you, Mr. President and members of council. The City of Lakewood is partnering with our local state representatives to apply for funds through the State of Ohio's capital budget. This is a biennial process in which local governments can request funding for projects with a broad community impact, like economic development, parks, or the arts. This application will request $500,000 of the estimated $1 million required to reconstruct Wager Park. The city believes excellent park space is critical to the success of the community. Wager Park is along an important commercial corridor and accessible by bike, bus, and foot. This park is located within a five-minute walk of the Lakewood Senior Center and Harding Middle School and directly adjacent to the YMCA's daycare program. Extensive planning for this park redesign has already been completed, which includes the 2015 Park System Strategic Plan update, numerous community meetings, opportunity to vote on preferred park concepts, and online surveys. The Rosewood Avenue Street Closure Pilot will inform the decision to add the park space, to add to the park space and make modifications as necessary to improve traffic around the park. I respectfully ask that Council consider adoption of this resolution referenced in this letter on first reading tonight. The signed resolution will be included with the capital budget project request <coughs> form to be filed as early as tomorrow. Mr. President, I apologize for the short turnaround on this one. Uh, we do feel like support from council will strengthen the application to the state. Thank you. Um, move to receive and file that communication. Second. Uh, motion has been made and seconded to receive and file the communication. Any discussion on the motion to receive and file the communication? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, that motion passes. Item 9, Resolution 897418, a resolution authorizing the city to execute and file application requests with the state of Ohio for a $500,000 of financial assistance through the capital budget, budget to be used for the revitalization of Wager Park. Move to adopt. Second. A motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to adopt? Mr. President. Yes, Councilman Bullock. Um, I had the, the opportunity today to speak with uh, the planning director and uh, get a little bit, bit of the background here. Um, I think it's a good uh, idea by the administration to pursue additional funds, especially for pricey capital projects uh, that might qualify for additional funds beyond our city, our city budget. Um, so that we can 
uh, get more done for the residents, improve the neighborhoods, et cetera. Uh, this is a great one. Um, we've done a lot of community input, groundwork, and design work already. So although it's not quite shovel ready, this is a this would be an application requesting support for a, for a uh, potential project that's got a lot of uh, high quality thought and community input and um, uh, demonstration by the city of competence and successful use of other funds. Uh, these are the kinds of things that go into successful grant applications. Um, and, and so I think um, the administration's uh, reasoning is very sound here to to identify uh, this potential, well, identify the Wager Park Improvement Project, which is in our capital plan but not yet funded, as a um, project for which we could apply to the state capital budget. So, um, so I'm satisfied, and I, I applaud uh, the continued efforts by the administration to to widen the budget pie and get more done more quickly. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, other comments or questions from council? Councilwoman George. Uh, thank you. Um, I just say I saw some of the renderings in uh, some of the meetings prior, and I I'm very excited to get this underway. Um, uh, my uh, my brother is a Rosewood Avenue resident, and uh, he uh, he I go over there often. I'm excited to visit that park as well. So I'm also excited and, and glad that we're looking for additional funds um, for this. So all in all, very good. Thanks. Other comments or questions? Hearing none, uh, I believe we have the motion to receive and file. That was the motion made last. Uh, all those in favor? I'm sorry, we have the motion to adopt. That's right. We are on the motion to adopt. Uh, all those in favor of adoption of resolution 8974-18, say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. Item 10, communication from Law Director Butler regarding prison meals. Law Director Butler, I'm already intrigued. <laughs> What are we eating this evening? <laughs> Congratulations, you're eating Discount Drug Mart. Thank you. <laughs> Dear members of council, I submit this letter on behalf of Finance Director Pei, who was on holiday at the time of its drafting. Uh, attached, please find a resolution that, if adopted, will allow the purchasing manager to award a contract to Discount Drug Mart without the necessity of competitive bidding, uh, which is permitted in uh, Section 111.04.A10 uh, of our codified ordinances. Finance Department reports the city has traditionally had little interest in the supply of meals for, that is to say, has received little interest in the supply of meals for prisoner consumption. This year, in an effort to gain more interest, an RFP process was conducted and local businesses were contacted directly to respond. Um, I can tell you in years past, we've uh, traditionally received our prisoner meals from the buy right on Madison, which is now closed. Uh, Discount Drug Mart was the only business that submitted a quote it is impractical and not cost effective to go through a formal bidding process under these circumstances. Please refer this matter to the appropriate committee for further review and discussion. I will note that um, uh, uh, Clerk uh, Hagen pointed out today that the uh, exhibit meant to be attached to the resolution that follows this communication <coughs> was omitted inadvertently. That was the law department's error, and I uh, take responsibility for it and apologize. We will bring that exhibit to uh, the, any committee meeting on the subject. And it's just discount drug marks filled in uh, quote uh, for meal services. Okay, thanks. Um, move to receive and file that communication. Second. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to receive and file? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, that motion passes. Item 11, resolution 897518. A resolution to enter into an agreement for prisoner meals <clears throat> with Discount Drug Mart without the necessity of bidding in accordance with local codified ordinance section 11104A10 in accordance with the City of Lakewood standard purchase order terms and conditions. Thank you. Um, my inclination here would be uh, public safety, unless there's a strong consensus otherwise. Um, I'm sorry, finance uh, I'm hearing is preferable to public safety um, from Finance Director Pei. Uh, any Discussion, I, so any issue with, with referral to finance as opposed to public safety? Seeing none, uh, I would move that we refer resolution 897518 to finance committee. Second. A uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, that motion passes.
Item 12, communication from Planning and Development Director Sylvester regarding authority to sell real property. Thank you. Director Sylvester. Thank you, Mr. President and members of council. On June 9, 2016, the city released a RFQ, Request for Qualifications, to identify a development partner to design and build infill housing in the historic Birdtown neighborhood. One of the primary goals of this initiative was to incorporate both affordable and market rate housing into the final plan. Pain and Pain builders were selected from a pool of five respondents. Pain and Pain's proposal called for a total of four single family homes to be located at the corner of Plover and Robin on parcels owned by the city of Lakewood. The project was phased to ensure the affordable units were constructed first and to leverage the momentum created through this unique partnership. Phase one is underway. Two single family attached homes are being financed using federal funds and are on track to be sold to low and moderate income buyers in the spring of this year. Phase two involves the construction of two market rate homes to be financed by the developer. Recently, Payne and Payne were approached by a prospective buyer looking to build one of the market rate homes. In order to move this project forward, I am requesting authority to sell parcels 315-22-074, also 2107 Robin, and 315-22-073, also known as 2111 Robin, to Payne and Payne. To explain how this small development will impact Birdtown and the city, consider that annually these properties netted a total of $3,700 in property taxes. Once sold, the four new homes will represent an estimated $730,000 in market value and will net an estimated total of $24,000 in annual property taxes in the year following a reintroduction into the market. That's an annual increase of over $20,000. I'd be happy to address questions and review this project in more detail at an up upcoming committee hearing. Uh, thanks for your time and consideration, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, move to receive and file that communication. Second. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to receive and file? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, that motion passes. Item 13, Ordinance 318, an ordinance to enter into an agreement with Payne and Payne Custom Builders, Inc. for the sale of 2107 Robin Street and 2111 Robin Street. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, given the nature of this ordinance, I would be inclined to refer to housing, uh, but I'm, of course, again, open to suggestions and preferences from Council. Hearing and seeing none, uh, move to refer to housing. A uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to refer to housing committee? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. Item 14. Liquor permit notice for D1, D2, D3, D3A, and D6 transfers to Woodford Cabernet Management doing business as Sushi Rock 15607 Madison Avenue from Rock Zoo. Thanks. Um, as is the custom uh, with these uh, liquor permit uh, applications, we typically defer as a body to the council person in whose ward the establishment lies. In this case, that's yours truly. Uh, Chief, are we in a in receipt of a report on this one? I don't believe we are, but I may have missed it. Not to the next meeting. Okay. Uh, then I would move to defer. Second. A motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to defer? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. And that brings us to the end of our docket for this evening. We do have uh, one person signed in for comment, uh, and that is Rico Dancy. Mr. Dancy. Hello, congratulations to Councilor. Um, I'm the president of the National Black Deaf Advocate. It reads, hi, my name is Rico Dancy. I am a US citizen in the deaf community. We are the deaf folks in the nation have lost two lives, one in Oklahoma and one in South Carolina. It's concerns to me is it safe for people who are deaf to drive? Is it safe for an officer to put a deaf person over and get shot in two seconds? Then they will say, it's an investigation. What is the investigation about? 
a person's deaf or the person can't hear. I serve over 25,000 million deaf people all around this country. And my board is concerned. Where the training? How many hours you get on mental health, deaf people? My whole family's deaf, both sides. I got a grandmother who bought a who just bought a house in Lakewood. She concerned is can she sit on her porch without getting shot? Or can any deaf citizens can sit on their porch? That bugs me. I hope one day I don't get a call said it's been a murder, homicide of a deaf person. I'm going to ask counsel. It got to be a conversation on public safety. It got to be a conversation. Because I have to point to my boss. My boss is the board members and the people in the deaf community who elect a president who are going to serve them. We need to have a conversation in safety on how many hours mental health. Cleveland here in Speech Center have an iPad for the police department in Cleveland, okay? They wrote the grant to get it. And also, we've been teaching police around this country um, how to communicate with people who are deaf, how to not to be afraid. When deaf people see, when police do not understand, they start signing, the first thing the police is going to do is reach for their gun. First thing they're going to do. I have seen it in Oklahoma. When deaf get out of his car, start assigning to the police, because uh, also did not, not educated or training, they shot him and he died in two seconds. Counsel, y'all are here to elect to serve the people. I'm here to serve the people in my job. We both got the same title, but of a different calling. Look at the training you have. The name of my company called the National Black Deaf Advocate. Another one, the National Association for the Deaf. We are concerned, the people is concerned, the deaf people are crying for help. We would be glad to teach the police. We would be glad to do the training. Just let us, let us, the people who have a disability, to come out and teach them. We have the disability. We was born deaf. I'm completely deaf in both my ears. My whole, both my side of my family are deaf. I'm concerned. I know y'all is too. Please, I'm big. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Summers. Yeah, um, Mr. Dancy, uh, Rico, uh, thanks for your words. Uh, I think you and I should meet after the meeting and we, uh, we can figure out how to take advantage of your offer to trade. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, Mayor Summers. Uh, Chief Malley, did you have something to add? Thanks. I already uh, met with Mr. Dancy and agreed to speak with them in the future about the training that they offer and that we can take a part of. So we'd be glad to do that. Great. Thanks. I appreciate the uh, proactive uh, engagement from the administration on this one. Uh, any other members? Yes, Councilman O'Malley. Rico, thanks for being here. Rico and I have uh, met as well. and. Um, I uh, certainly would defer to the mayor and the police chief, but if there's a role for council to have, uh, I'm certainly uh, um, glad to, uh, for us to take it up in public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was our sole uh, public comment. Um, as is our custom, we'll now turn it over for any announcements from the administration or from council. The administration, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, President O'Leary, members of council, members of the audience. Actually, I'm very pleased to announce that Lakewood uh, has uh, been awarded a $216,474,000 grant from NOPEC. NOPEC is our electrical aggregator and our natural gas aggregator. 
and as a consequence of uh, their business model, which is a, basically a mutual organization owned by its member communities and the benefits shared with its member communities, uh, these grants have been made to every member community. Our portion is a direct result of the number of uh, citizens who use and elect NOPEC as their electrical and natural gas source. It's a significant amount of money. I would suspect one of the largest in the NOPEC uh, customer base. The purpose of the grant is to allow us to make investments uh, to improve energy efficiency in energy infrastructure. I think we can find some very interesting uses for this large amount of money. Certainly some things that come to mind would be the electrical uh, charging stations we've been talking about. In addition, uh, we've also talked about solar panels on our service garage. Uh, the first step was to get our roof in place, which we uh, did part of it last year. The rest is being done this year, so that may be an opportunity to pursue that particular project and perhaps others as well. So I'll be offering a letter on the next council docket. You can refer it to committee and we'll begin to sort out how we want to spend this money. Thank you. Uh, that's certainly exciting and I'm glad to hear uh, that we're continuing to explore those alternate funding options. Uh, Law Director Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I only want to take the opportunity to congratulate our new council members uh, and uh, also to congratulate Councilman Bullock on his reelection. Um, and as well to congratulate you, Mr. Chair, and Councilman Anderson on your uh, re-election to the council leadership positions. Thanks. Okay, uh, announcements from council. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got one more from the administration, <laughs> at least one more. Director Gelsomino. Thank you, President, and I appreciate it. Um, council members, I just want to take this moment to remind you that February 3rd is our H2O 25th anniversary celebration. Um, it's important. H2O is one of the most critical, critical um, wellness programs that we offer in this community for our young people. Uh, it builds not only service learning opportunities, but really leaders for the future. So you should be receiving invitations. If not, please say something. Um, and we hope that you will all be with us February 3rd. Thank you. Uh, announcements? Any other announcements from the administration? Hearing none. Announcements from council? Also hearing none. Uh, move to adjourn. Second. A motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to adjourn? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, we're adjourned. Thank you all again. <laughs>